The following is a conversation with Paul Daniel of the Flying D. Paul also has the Flying D franchise futurity one loft race down in Chico, Texas, and tells us about his process of selecting his own one loft birds to send out and how he runs his race. I really appreciate Paul's time. And I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Thank you. All right, Paul Daniel, the Flying D. Thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. You bet, buddy. Thanks for having me. I uh, am wearing my Flying D hat today. It is green, though, so when I turn sideways, it kind of disappears sometimes. With the green, the green water? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you and I have known each other a long time. You used to be up in Claremore, Oklahoma, and flew in the same area as me, same federation. Uh, now you're yes, down sir. in Chico, Texas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yep. before all that, you're, you're a bit of a renaissance man. You've, you've been in a lot of different businesses and a lot of you've had a lot of life experience with different things different animals bulls and pigeons and all sorts of stuff where did pigeons begin for you uh my father had birds all my life i was born and raised with pigeons my dad had fancy birds he was crazy into parlor rollers and performing rollers and fantails and uh, different stuff like jay Cobins and different stuff like that he loved fancy pigeons he had homers, uh, but they were mainly used for foster parents back in the day when I was a kid. Uh, but I liked them and enjoyed them. And so, therefore, at that time, you know, we used to take them to school with us and turn them loose. And then when we get home in the evening, see if they were there, you know, and, and they always was, which, I mean, we wasn't 10 or 12 miles from the house. So uh, that was kind of fun and neat. And I got into the rollers big for many, many years. That was my love and passion for, for first for me for the for the pigeon sport and um, did extremely well in that. Um, competed all over, won lots and lots and lots of stuff. We won't get into that. Um, but it was a blast. I enjoyed it. And then it, you know, it kind of run its course. I, I like something uh, I'm, inter, you know, more entertaining, a little more challenging, and a little more competitive. And, and, and it's always fun when there's money back in it. So, right. Uh, that always makes it a little more enticing. So, so where where'd you grow? Where'd you grow up? Where was this that you had those as a kid? Born and raised in Tennessee as a kid, and then we moved to San Jose, California, and that's where I spent uh, most of my teenage years uh, into my early twenties, and that's where we flew rollers and big time and had a blast and flew with a lot of the world famous, you know, top notch world roller guys in the country still today. Um, and that's where we did. Then we, we moved from California to Colorado, and that's when I got into the racing homers pretty heavy. I had a good friend of mine that was a personal friend of my mother's. His wife and my mom grew up all four years. They were best friends all four years in high school. And so uh, his name was Bob Schneider in California, the double BS loft, and he was a good friend. Uh, his wife wasn't my mom and he come to my sister's wedding and we got to talking pigeons and that's how it went from there. And I told him I'd been really thinking about getting into the homers, racing homers. And he said, I tell you what, uh, and I told him he's fixing to move to Colorado. And he said, Hey, come by before you leave and I'll give you a handful of pairs and, uh, get you started. And that's where it started and, uh, been hooked ever since. And yeah. It's been a blast. Well, at what point uh, did you start racing then after getting them? Did you race in California or was it Oklahoma that started? Where did that begin? Uh, Colorado. Yeah, I flew in um, in Denver, Colorado with the Rocky Mountain Racing Club there, and Phil Cowridge and and um, Steve Bueller and all them guys back in the day. Uh, great group of guys, a lot of fun. They taught me a lot of stuff and um, started flying. I actually, that's the first where I started my first race on actual races at club races and uh, Phil Cowridge used to have the uh, spirit of, or the Rocky mountain challenge. And then it changed to the spirit of Colorado. Right. And that's where I got my first experience in the one loft races. And uh, it went from there a blast. Well, then uh, you started racing in Oklahoma after that. Is that when you moved in there? When we, when we, when we moved from Colorado, to, to, to Tulsa. We was just in Tulsa for about six months and then we actually settled in Claremore and I was in Claremore for 18 years. Yeah. And 
that's where we, you know, really started racing club and having fun. And then the, the one off races were really just starting to really kind of kick up then, you know, right. we had the Keystone classic and then the Mark Martis's races. And mm-hmm. then Chris Peeman had his down here in Texas with the, with the shootout. And uh, I'm trying to remember the other one. And then, Crazy Al had the him and Steve Bueller had the race in Colorado, the the Gold Rush. Uh, I won that race and on the first route, that's first one I ever won, and it was pretty cool. Still got the gold yeah. medallions today that they that they give for the for the winners, and it was pretty cool. When you win so, a race like that, that's that's when you really are hooked and and uh, yeah, it's it's I mean it's in your jaw. Yeah. You ain't getting away from it then. It's yeah, it's, it's bad because of uh, uh, it just. It hooks you, and then you know you win and excitement, and then win a little money to boot, and then it's just, yeah, you run. Yeah, so it was. I've been running ever since. Yeah, I understand. I'm in that same boat. I was talking to Steve Martis about my first one off experience was in his Twister race they have there, and, and more in Oklahoma, just south of Oklahoma City, and I had one in that first drop, and boy, I you know after that, <laughs> it, it was it's uh, bad. It's bad. Yeah, it's a challenge though, you know. Uh, it's it's a different today it is yeah i mean today is a big challenge i mean the quality of pigeons and the quality of guys that's in this in this game now is just mind blowing at the yeah. quality of guys and pigeons that that are out there today i mean the pigeon florida derby's flying right now as we speak uh pretty awesome and so uh, the the sure numbers and and the, the money that's being paid out and the, uh the level of competition has just got fierce I mean, you have to come, you have to come loaded for bear and hunting hair. Or you're, you're behind the game, right? So, you know, we're always looking for new and upcoming quality pigeons, trying to improve the program. And if you don't, like I tell people all the time, if you're standing still, you're go, you're backing up because yeah, ninety eight percent of the guys in this business are not standing still. They're always searching, looking, trying to find the next big thing or the next hot pair or the next hot bird. And um, it's crazy at, at the competition out there. It's but it's fun. That's what makes it yeah. fun. Yeah, and I think uh, the way social media is and the internet, it's allowed people to get access to pigeons they wouldn't have been able to before. And uh, you know, the information that's out there on what's what's doing well in certain areas is much easier to obtain. So it makes it much more competitive for anyone to start out with great pigeons and send them out to these one lofts and do pretty darn well. Um, yeah. And I'm- like anything else you know what the, the good stuff costs money and if you got money to buy the good stuff you can you can sure put your name at the top pretty fast with you know with some extra dollars um right. you know and that it is what it is and there's nothing wrong with that uh you know just like i always tell people quality cost but it pays off in the long run absolutely especially if you do it right yes uh, so Let's back up to you flying club. So at what point when you were up there in Claremore, did you think to yourself that you'd want to do your own one loft? Because I think that some of the best one loft guys that are in the country uh, have a background of racing themselves and having success as a racer themselves. And that allows them to branch out into handling a, a big group of birds. You know, if someone didn't have a lot of race experience and they were to start a one loft, I think they'd be in some trouble with the amount of, work it goes into it so when when did you decide you wanted to do one and how did that process go uh it never happened in claremore uh it didn't happen until i moved to texas and um i flew you know flew for many many years up there and that was really before the one lock game was you know uh i could say really big you know right. it was it was coming along but club racing was still the thing. Club yeah. racing was still at the top of everybody's list. You know, everybody was still, that was what you talked about, bragged about. You look forward to young bird season, old bird season. Um, it was still young. Oh, when one off racing was still really, really soft then. It was real, it was real mild. It wasn't big. You know, you didn't have, you know, maybe 10 or 15 races total in the whole country at that time. And maybe didn't even have that many, if I think about it for a second. Um, you know, you had your, I think, San Diego races and uh, Martis's and, and the Keystone Classic and um, Chris Pingman stuff. There wasn't a lot of them. Um, so at that time, the one loft racing was not a, not a big craze yet because guys were still, 
you know, pounding the, the, the pavement with, with club birds. And, and that's, it was fun then. Yeah. You know, the that, clubs we were still, a lot bigger too, right? There's a lot oh, more yeah. numbers. Still, still huge, a lot of I mean, when I, yeah. When I flew in the Claremore, you know, with the Tulsa, you know, the Federation and everything, we had, you know, 150, 200 lofts in the yeah. combine in, in the Federation, yeah. you know, and we were spread out from, uh, you know, Ponca city all the way to Claremore, you yeah. know, it was, 125 miles wide yeah and it was fun you know and when they and you can't beat mother nature you know when they got when they got the wind in their direction punk and silly to kill us and then when we got the money you know while we got the wind in our direction we kill them so you can't beat mother nature she bats a thousand yeah but that's what makes it fun with club racing um and club racing is still a blast but the problem is it's just you know, and what, what makes it funny is back then we had the old wind-up clocks, you know, okay. with the with the counter marks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, it, and it was harder, tougher, longer, took longer. It, it wasted a – I, I take this, don't take me wrong, it didn't waste a whole weekend, but it wasted a weekend. Uh, you know, because you full were – You're full-time. You know, time. you'd go to people on Friday night. You'd sit at the house all day long on Saturday waiting on birds, and then you'd go to Sunday to bump clocks. Yeah. So the the club racing was fun then, but it was hard then, but it was big. But now things have got 10 times easier and club racing has just continued to, you know, drop off bad. I mean, it just isn't what it is because of the one loft game has taken over. There's money to be made. There's money to have. And the competition is fierce. Um, you know, so it's really put a damper on club racing, I should say. Yeah, I think it has uh, in some regard. I think also just, you know, as you said, it's just club racing takes so much more time during the week. You have to have a system in place. You got you to hit the road and train, or even if you're just loft line, you got to be there. And yeah, you can have a clock that scans your birds and you don't have to necessarily be there on race day, but, um, you know, it, ideally you can be there and watch them come in. So it's, it still does take a lot of time. Um and commitment to do it so one loft definitely opens that up but uh, you know one of the coolest parts of one loft uh, to me is that you know i'm here in oklahoma and i can send my birds anywhere i want and race against people in new york or california or washington or florida or arizona and and you get to kind of experience different parts of the country and see where your birds can can excel or where they may not do quite as well or conditions you know you can get different conditions down in Florida than you can in California or, or up north somewhere or down in Texas where, where your race is and Cuevas and black and gold and some of these guys that are in that area. Um, yeah. you know, so you can challenge your birds in a way that you can't in a club. So it's, it's definitely, uh, with, with as spread out as we are in America, it's definitely the trend. And as Tony said, we, we have the best one loft races in the world right here. Oh, no questions by all means. And I mean, the guys across the pond from us are jealous because, not only do we have the best races, but we have a lots of them. You know, you have a lot, you have a big menu to choose from. You know, right. you have, you have races from the, the little ones to the very, very expensive ones, little few birds to lots of birds. You know, it's, it, it's, it's fun. And, and you have, like you said, you can race in Florida, you can race in, in Louisiana, you can race in California and there's different weathers, different winds, different courses, different style of pigeons. Um, uh, we're all looking for that pigeon that can win everywhere, but right. that's, that's, that's really a, not really happening. That ain't going to happen. I mean, very few pigeons can win, you know, every course just because they're just, there is horses for courses. Right. Um, you know, it's just, it is what it is. It's just all or two. Uh, you know, I, I try my best and so does everybody else to produce that type of pigeon that will, you know, come on, six, eight, 10 different courses in Texas, California, Louisiana, Florida, you know, wherever, but there is still horses for courses. And there is a such thing as a one law pigeon, you know right. what I'm saying? That's, there is a difference between a one law pigeon and in a, in a club pigeon. They're not the same kind of pigeon. I promise you. Well, um, that, that's, that's something I've asked almost everybody that is in the one loft game on these interviews so far. And I definitely want to get into that debate because Everybody has their different feelings on that. Before we do, though, you went down to Texas from Claremore after racing in Claremore for 18 years. Then that's when you decided you wanted to do your own version of a one loft down there with the the franchise fraternity, right? Right. Well, I got I got down here, um, 
and started club racing down here. And then, um, you know, CL Gage them had the Texas shootout right, right up the road from me, 20 miles. And so I talked to them, talked to some different friends and, you know, they've kind of wanted me to, if I was going to do something, they wanted me to do something right on top of that race. That way they could get a bam, bam. And the same weekend come see two big races. Well, um, I had this concept with the franchise part of it. I had the concept. I, I did the same concept in the buck and bull world and it was major successful. I, uh, we did the same deal, sold 150 franchises, sold out in four hours. Um, it was unbelievable. Badass. Well, uh, when I kind of fizzled out of them, got out of the buck and bulls, I, I'd had enough of that. My body was showing signs and paying the price for all the stuff and being hurt and run over and broke up and everything's been broke on me. You name it, it's been broke and uh, you just get older and enough's enough. Yeah. So sold out of that business and, and thought, you know what, I'm going to do something that I can be right here at the house and enjoy because I enjoy my pigeons. And I was flying quite a few one loft races at that time. And so I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to carry that over into the pigeon world and do it in the pigeon world and create a elite, elite group of guys um, that wants to fly with small number and a big payout. Um, you know, you can, there is plenty of races out there, the Hoosier, the Florida Derby, California Classic, a lot of these races, um, you know, the Dash for Cash, Cuevas, uh, Black Gold, a lot of these races that will have 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 pigeons. And that's fun, and that's fine and dandy, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to create something where your odds would be great and your payout would be great, you know what I'm saying? But your number of pigeons would be small. And so therefore it would it would allow guys to have to send three badass quality pigeons instead of sending a team of 30 or 40 to find them two or three pigeons. And it's nothing bad about it. I mean, I send 20 or 30 birds to the Hoosier every year uh, just because there's it's a big race. It's fun. Uh, the com competition is great. The money's great. So you're, you know, you're trying to compete and you've got to have some numbers in them kind of races, I feel, to be uh, competitive because their losses are a lot heavier than a lot of the smaller races because they're dealing with thousands and thousands of pigeons. So therefore, you know, they have a little more difficulties than a guy that's got three or four or 500 birds. So that's my feel on that. But so I started the race. I, I did it and I didn't start it. I actually put it out to a few friends. And uh, we have an award that we give away in our race called the, the King of the Hill Award, Tom Hill. Yeah. Personal friend of mine. Well, I, him and Dan Corey flew down to, to the Texas shootout race to be here for it. They stayed at my place. They're good friends of ours. So they, they stayed here instead of getting a motel. Well, while they were here, I presented my case to them say hey this is what i'm thinking this is what i'm talking about doing i'm thinking about what's your thoughts well about two minutes after i presented my little presentation to them just in in general sitting in the living room in the easy chair tom hill stands up pulls his out of a wad of money out of his pocket and he counts off 1500 100 auto bills and lays them on my coffee table and he says i want the first franchise and I said, no, we're just talking about this. He said, I want the first franchise. Well, Dan Corey stands right up behind him and says, counts all 1,500 and lays it on the table and says, I'll take the second franchise. And I said, guys, I appreciate that, but we're not doing this yet. We're just talking about it. Right. So the whole weekend, them two knuckleheads would not pick up that money. They left it sitting on the coffee table all weekend. It was laid right on the coffee table. Nobody touched it. And I kept telling them to get it, and they wouldn't touch it. Well, they got back from the race, come back here to the house, and was getting their stuff together because they was fixing to fly back to Arizona in Dan's plane. Well, I told them, hey, take that money, and if, if it's something I do something, you guys got one and two, no questions. Nope, they wouldn't take it. Would not take it. Left it sitting there. So Kimberly put it in the envelope, both of them with their names on it, and stuck it in the safe. It sat in the safe for a year and a half before I decided to pull the trigger and do the race. Right. And I, I wouldn't take their money back. I tried to give it. They wouldn't take it. <laughs> and so uh, I don't know if they thought the, the pure pressure would pressure me into doing it, but some part of it may have worked, but it worked. So we done the deal. Um, 
and here we are today. We're six years in and having a blast. So the race is great. Uh, it's fun and, and, and we're enjoying it. Yeah. So. And I, you know, like you said, like we've talked about, the USA has so many options for one loss. You can get into races like the Florida Derby or the Hoosier that has massive numbers. But one of the things I enjoy about your race is that, you you know, as you have to be a pigeon fancier as, as a breeder, you have to select the three that you think gives you the best chance. And, you know, you, you know, there's going to be some luck involved, but you really have to select from your best pairs to send. And you know, the other guys are doing the same thing. So when you have pigeons that are successful there, it's, it's a great feeling because uh, it, it, it shows that, you know, you did good selection when you do well at your race. So I think yes. with all the variety in the country, what you have going on is a, is a good uh, niche to that for sure. Yeah. I mean, you have to dig deep and, and uh, you know, there is a lot of luck involved. Uh, but it sometimes, you know, it does come down to good, good quality pigeons too. Um, you know, cause you got to select out of the best of the best to be competitive because like you said, the other 170 or 80 guys that's in the race are doing the same identical thing. So you're, you know, you're competing against the best of the best. The quality is absolutely out of this world. And I tell people every year I'm blessed because the quality of pigeons I deal with every year is amazing. Right. So I feel like to a certain extent, it makes my job a little bit easier than a lot of these other races that get a mass majority of pigeons and they get pigeons from people that, you know, they're not really pigeon people. They got a few pair of birds or, and they don't saying they're just grabbing babies and sending them. And so the quality I think is not as good and I ain't being ugly. There's nothing disrespectful about that, but just, the, you know, what it costs to be in this race. So therefore guys, not just, he's not sending out a test bombs you know, he's not just saying, oh, I got two extra babies. I'm going to send them down there. That's not what's going on. So the quality of pigeons is amazing. So if you win this race or in the top of this race, you've done something because of who and what you got to compete against. Right. Oh, so that's the fun of it. And you all throw an awesome event. I think that you would agree when I say that without Kimberly, I don't know if any of this is possible for you, right? Without Kimberly, I don't want to do it. I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> You all threw a, threw a great party that people can come and hang out. And one of the things I really uh, respected about your the weekend down there is you looked at the weather and you said, sorry, guys, Saturday is not going to do it for the birds. It's, it's, it's dangerous for the birds. I know everybody's, you know, coming down, but we have to do what's best for the pigeons. We're going to move this thing to Sunday. And there was nobody that I saw that was upset with that decision. They all thought, you know, you know what, we'll, if we can be there Sunday, we'll be there, but we got to, we got to do what's best for the birds and we respect your decision. And and I thought that was a great move. So I just wanted to give you a thumbs up for that, for sure. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. It, at the end of the day, uh, a party still a party and we want to throw a party and have a great time and entertain and, 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 and take care of our customers and feed them good and drink them good and, and do all that stuff. But at the, at the end of the day, the most important thing is the pigeons and we're all here because of the pigeons. So like I've told people before, I, I'm a big fan and a big stickler on setting a date and sticking to it. And I have for six years, except in this year. Uh, and I've said from the get go that I would set a date, stick to it, unless it was a hundred percent detrimental to the birds and yeah. it was not feasible. And right. that, this year was not feasible. You know, we had 35, 40 mile an hour winds it was just not feasible. So therefore, I'm not going to waste eight, nine months of hard work uh, just to throw it away just because guys are like, hey, I'm already here, you know, I don't, and I want to see a pigeon race. Well, I want you to see a pigeon race, but at the same time, I want you to see a pigeon race. I don't want you to see a disaster, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I love keeping to the date. I, I love it because you take what God gives you on that day you know, whether it be fast, slow, or indifferent. We've had them, we've had them from only five day birds to 1900 yards a minute. But I, I can't help that when you set a date and you stick with it, you take what God gives you on that day and you raise pigeons and you hope you got something there with the speed or on the day when we only had five day birds, you, you would hope you had something with some guts and, and some, you know, get down and get dirty, come home pigeons. So right. that's the fun of the game. Yes, we could move our racing around. We could we could bounce the dates around, or not even set a date, and and make it you know uh, uh, somewhat of a more of a perfect type race. But I don't know. To me, that's 
that's what makes ours a little different. And I'm not wrong with anybody else that does because I've competed in races uh, last year that guys moved their, their dates around and picked great days that were great working days. I'll say it. The Texas Dash for Cash, he had a great series last year, done a great job. He picked great days that kept his races down, you know, in the 12 and 1300s. It was absolutely amazing. Every race was a good working race. You see the best pigeons come to the top. The quality kept coming week after week after week. Um, and that's awesome. But there's, you know, I mean, if you're going to set a date and stick to it and have a big party and have everybody spend thousands of dollars on plane tickets and motels and rent a cars and all this right there, you know, it's so that's why we set a date and we try to stick to it, you know, to, to make everything work. And that way you get what you get on that day. And this year it just worked out that we just could not do it. Trust me, for a week, no sleep, nerve shot, watching the weather like a dead gum weather man, you know, just crazy. Every app I can find to look at. to do what's best for the pigeon and the breeder at the same time. We don't want you to waste your time and money of hard work and put your good birds here just to throw them away just for, just because, oh, I got a party going and I don't, you know, I, I just want to raise pigeons no matter what happens. Well, I like sticking to a date, but at the same time, we've got to take care of pigeons. Okay. Okay. That's the most important part because that's what we're doing this. Right. So, uh, yeah. And, and that's and why we make the decision to move to Sunday. It was great. It turned out to be a great day. We had a great race, and everybody, you know, was taken to death. Yeah, we didn't like it because a lot of our friends had to go home. But I apologize for that. You know, it is what it is. So, I mean, yeah. um, but at the end of the day, people called and said, look, yeah, we didn't get to stay. We didn't get to see it. But we appreciate you, you know, making that decision and taking care of the birds and putting on a great race. And, then, you know, it is what it is. So. Yeah, and even though, uh, you know, some of them may not have been able to see the race Sunday, I mean, you all put together a great party. There's a great spread of food. You all had a DJ there for the ladies. There was some jewelry and uh, that you could have created. There's some hats you could get. Uh, you know, Kimberly did a great job on the vendors. So it really is an experience for the whole weekend that you all put on. So if there's anyone watching this that's considering it next year to go, I, I can tell you Jan and I had a great time and can't wait to come back. So, Congratulations to you guys this year, man. You guys are awesome. Put three yeah. birds in the money out of three. Pretty awesome, my friend. Pretty yeah, awesome. you know, that was a great feeling to select three and to see them uh, all come through on the final like that. And that's this is a good time, I guess, to transition into a pigeon that I've named All Heart. And you, you helped me come up with that name because uh, after the first race, you gave me, a, a, I think it was a messenger video of, of one of my birds, a blue check white flight cock. And uh, you said, hey, just let you know the reason this bird was late on that first race is he, he banged his wing really bad. He's real swollen. And so you said, you know, what, what do you want to do? And we talked a little bit. And I said, well, let's give him a couple weeks. Let him, you know, see if he can heal up a little bit. And I said, I trust your judgment because I, I know you. I know your background on how much uh, racing you've done. I know when you, you know what a pigeon looks like, if it's ready to go or not. Um, so... You told me, you know, we'll just give him a few weeks. Well, I'll, I'll let you take over the story from here, but he started slowly kind of moving up the perches, healing up over time before you started letting him out, right? Hey, Paul. Hey, before you get into that, Paul, let's check the mic. I think the phone may have taken over on that. Just check that mic on the bottom. Let's make sure it's the Mac. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep, I got you. So yeah, now we can. Uh... Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, I got you. So anyway, right. let's, so, let's talk about uh, that process with that pigeon. Okay, so just a just a cool pigeon. Um, man, I don't know how he made it home. I guess just like you said, sheer heart and determination. Um, because when he got home. You know, I, I walked in there and 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 I, I how I noticed it because I turned the birds out next day, and when I pushed them out, he everybody took off and he was still sitting on the landing board and I thought, what in the world? So I walked outside. Why is he doing that? So I went to kind of shoo him and he jumped off the landing board about a foot and 
he couldn't do anything. Couldn't even fly. So I eased around him and walked him back in. And so I walked it and opened his wing up and the hole underneath on the one side of his wing was just swollen and purple and blue and, and uh, wow. So that's when I got a hold of you and said, look, this guy's, he got, he got whacked. I mean, I don't know why he got hurt hard, but you know, what's crazy is them birds have so much heart and their adrenaline is pumping, you know what I'm saying? And they're still kind of loose. And he, he made it home. He was late. He made it home. But then after the next day, you know, swollen and, and inflammation and everything set in on him. And hell, he couldn't even, that wing was just dragging. Right. Couldn't even to the perch, you know, which was foot and a half, two foot off the ground. So I got a hold of you and said, look, you told me, I said, look, I trust you. Get on with it. You just tell me what to do and we'll see what I said. Let me, let me, let me work with him and let's see what we can do. So I watched him you know, daily when I would feed that section, I watched him and he just, you know, for days and days and days, he stayed on the floor, couldn't get off the floor. Then he went from all of a sudden I walk in there and he's on the bottom perch. Okay. So then within a few days after that, he's, I go in there and he's three or four perches higher. Well, a week later, he done moved up to the top perch. Check that. Check that or right. to make sure you cut out for just a second. Maybe the internet. Is that better? Yeah, I got you. So he got to the top perch. Is that better? You got me now? Yeah, I got you now. Okay. Well, he got to the top perch. And um, so about every three, two to three days, I would just grab him, walk over to the door, and hold him up in the air and turn him loose. You know, and he, you know, he on down. Well, after about a week, he, then he, you know, get a bottom perch or two, you know, from the drop. Well, I kept doing that, kept doing that, you know, about every day or two or three days. Well, within about a week and a half, two weeks later, hell, I'd drop him. He'd go right back up that top perch. I said, okay, now it's time you can go back outside. So we put him out and, and um, I, the birds would already loft flown. Well, I would take and just throw him out by himself. He'd fly around for, you know, five minutes or so and land, you know, and he was, you know, he was hurting and out of shape and that thing was still, you know, he, right. well, over another week or so, I did that, did that, did that, did that pretty soon, you know, I'd turn him loose and he'd fly for 15, 20 minutes by himself. So then I moved him back into the, into the loft and loft flew the birds. Well, the first time I flew him, loft flew him with the birds, he flew for about 45 minutes with the birds and come down early. And so I thought, okay, I see you, big boy. So he went in, no big deal. I didn't, wasn't mad at him. So the next day I lost flew him again. He flew for about 45, 50 minutes the next day. Well, the third time I lost flew him, he flew for over an hour and a half with him. So I thought, all right. So that's when I called, I think I called you. Yeah. And I said, look, he, he flew for over an hour and a half or almost two hours a day with the birds. And I'm fixing to go on a on a short toss tomorrow. What do you think? And he said, "Well, you said whatever. Did you, I trust you. Do whatever you think." I said, "I'm taking him." So I took him. I think I went maybe 60 miles that day, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. No, yeah. Like 60, 60 miles. Turned him. Turned him loose. Well, he was about 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes late. I thought, okay, he's trying. So then I I said something to you, and I said, "Well, we'll give him another day or two. I'll offer him another day or two. And then I I think I had. The um, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, help me out. Let me see. Was it a 75 miler or 80 miler? Yeah, you had a miles? you had like a 75 80 mile before the upcoming 250, and you basically yes. told me if he does well on this training, I think he can go on that 250. Yep. So yeah, so I I uh, took him. I think 80 miles, and boom, he was he was on the drop, no problem. So I said, Bubba, we I think we should ship him. I mean, mm -hmm. because we're getting down to the nut cutting. And, you know, you're fixing to have to pay for him. So we need to see if he's worthy of being paid for. So we took him on it and uh, bam, you know, he come in. I think he was uh, on the 200. What was he like? I think he was uh, like two uh, on the 200. He was about 45 minutes to an hour late. But that uh -huh. that was expected being his first race back after the injury. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So then I trained him. I think we trained him another few times. And uh, he, he was every training toss, he was 
right there, right there. And then every law fly, he was no problem, fly the whole time. So that's when I said something to you. What do you think? You know, I mean, we, you got to make a decision on this pigeon, you know, and that's when you said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, my honest opinion, I think the pigeon is good enough to go. I mean, I think the pigeon is, he's got heart. He won't quit. I mean, he's just, he's yeah. blowed up. He's pretty. Everything, all, everything looked good with the wing. And so we shipped him, and the rest is history. Yeah, and for those that don't know, uh, we were there in person <laughs> on that Sunday, and there was a drop of six pigeons that hit, and, uh, you know, we weren't able to get into that first drop, but we sat there patiently, and all of a sudden the blue check, white flight cock, all heart, hits the landing board, goes in, traps seventh right after that first drop, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't believe it at first, but then I kind of peeked over at the loft and you kind of peeked your head out and said, he did it. You know, you, you, uh, <laughs> you can see the big smile on your face. You're real proud of that bird. And, you know, I seen him hit the landing board. I knew that was him. And I thought, oh, man, all heart. There he is. Yeah. And uh, just an amazing story, an amazing pigeon that, that he could just come back from such an injury and, and then go. And here's the cool thing jump from 200 to 400 yeah. and then do it and be at the top with that caliber of pigeons uh, just shows the sheer quality of the pigeon and the sheer heart of the bird. Yeah. And he, so. he, does, he is, you know, when you handle him, he's top quality and the heart is all there, but um, it, it's also that you're an excellent fancier that you noticed that there was an injury. You didn't immediately stick him back in a training basket and lose him, you know, the next day on a toss, you know, you, you really care for the birds that are there and, and take great care of them. So your abilities as a fancier to get the bird slowly over a couple of week period, you know, kind of to heal up enough and just keep watching him and everything that shows the amount of care and, and time that you put into it and how much uh, we appreciate that. I can't even explain, but uh you know, it was awesome to see that, and it, it's uh, definitely something I won't forget, that bird's performance. So, Yeah, that's awesome. You know, and it's happened, uh, not a story just like that, but we've had a few other little stories, you know what I'm saying? We've sewed them up, and they've been in the money. Uh, we've healed them up, and they've been in the money, so it's been pretty cool. Um, and I, I love I love stories like that. I love – I love – I just – you know, I think the bird deserves every, every chance he can get. He didn't do nothing wrong. He just, you know, something happened to him, and he ran yeah. into something. And, uh, just needed a little bit of time. And like you said, you know, uh, not paying attention, he would have got thrown back in the basket and I'd have dumped him 50 or 60 miles down the road and he'd still be there, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I would have thought that it was not, you know, that mating didn't work yeah. or that he wasn't a good yeah. bird or whatever. So that amount of care that you put into it is, is awesome. So, uh, we were able to get, uh, one at 23rd and our last one came in at 31st and, uh, so we, we had a, a heck of a day. It was, it was definitely something to behold. Yeah. That was down about three in the money out of three pigeons. That's yeah. awesome, buddy. I don't know that it's been done. I'm I was thinking about that and I don't know that anybody's sent three and put three in the money. So I think I'll have to look into that, but I think you're the only one that you've ever, that's the only one that's ever been done. That's pretty that's awesome. awesome. That is yeah. pretty awesome. Kimberly said the same thing. She said, I think that's the only one that you've the only one that's ever done it. Yeah. Well, that's pretty awesome, and I'm glad we were able to be there in person and and uh, real. Hey, Kimberly. Yeah, there, hi. There, there, for everyone hi. who doesn't know, there's Kimberly Daniels. She makes it all work. She yes. she's the, the boss. Puts it all together. Yeah. Puts awesome a great um, weekend good. together. And I can't recommend people coming. You know, people have to come down and see it and be a part of it. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. We have a lot of crew, a lot of great people. It. And the cool thing hi, is, hi. is all right. See you. The cool thing is we couldn't do it without our friends that help us. I mean, we have such an amazing group of friends that come and help and have never charged us a dollar. They do it out of the kindness of their heart and the true, you know, friendship uh, is just, it's an amazing set of people. Uh, Brandon and Brandy, Curtis and Sandy and Brad and Lindsay and, and the cook and cowboys and all the people that, uh, man we our could sponsors. our sponsors yeah we couldn't do it without them you know loft uh, manager yep. cruise feed primal yeah primal lack um, loft manager cruise feed I'm I mean, we there. couldn't uh, we couldn't do it without everybody i mean these people uh they help make this thing go off and that's that's the fun of it that's the cool thing you know what i'm saying um 
at the end of the day, you know, it, that's that's one of the most important things to me is the 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 the, the friendships of everybody and the uh, you know everybody that jumps in and helps and and uh, nobody's too good. They'll just slip on an apron and get in there, you know. And that's the that's the cool thing. Uh, you don't find that everywhere. And a lot of people I know tell me all the time, say, "Man, we're jealous of of the of the people that you have around you that is such." Uh, yeah. amazing that will jump yeah. in and help and, and just be a big part of what you do and, and don't ever and ask for nothing in return. Yeah. So, and that's the thing too. Uh, when we were there, it was our first time being down there, but everybody's so welcoming and you feel like it's a big family event. Uh, you know, you see uh, Kevin Jones brought his kids along and other people brought their kids, you know, so it's just a big family event and you get to meet a lot of different people. And uh, so that's one of the funnest parts of one lofts is going, going in person. So you all do a fantastic job of that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank what, uh, what do you recommend to people watching that are getting into one lofts? Maybe they're experienced or maybe they're new. What, what do you recommend for them as their process, getting their birds ready to ship to a one loft? What do, what's the process like for you that you, you think gives people the best chance? Uh, for me, this is just for me. I uh, I breed on lights 24 hours a day, you know, lights when I breed my breeders. And so when I wean my babies, they go from 24-hour lights to no lights. So therefore, my babies start into a molt really quick, fast, you know, wing, uh, the shoulders, the, they start dropping a wing. Um, and I don't, I tell people this all the time. Matter of fact, I told the man this this morning that called me. Um, I would rather you keep a pigeon a week longer at your house than a week too early at my house. So uh, don't send them too extremely old, but don't send them too young either. You need, you need that pigeon. And so for me, let me just back up. For me, I put them in the loft. They start molting because of no lights. Well, when the pigeons drop their first flight, I ship them to the one loft races. But before I do that, I pull the four center tail feathers when I ship out. I think that really jump starts the immune system. Um, it really, it really gets them, you know, gets their gets their immune system bouncing and going. And you're fixing to dump them into dump them into a cesspool with a lot of different bacteria and, and a lot of different uh, viruses type stuff that's floating that they may not be used to or whatever. So therefore I want their shield up as much as I can get it up, you know what I'm saying, to help them to defend what's coming. Uh, one of the biggest things that I do, and I think it's so cool and I think it's crazy, uh, crazy good, is I put my babies now, but let me say this, we live in Texas. It's hot in Texas. We have a lot of humidity. So therefore, sometimes we may fight things that some guys that live up north or some guys that live out west uh, that don't face like we face. So one of the biggest problems down here is streptococcus, okay? Um, and one of the biggest killers of, of babies at a one-off race when the circle virus hits, which I'm telling you, the circle virus is coming. It comes every year to 99.9% .9 of every one loft race in the business. They get right. a, They get it. It's coming. I get it every year. But I think this is just me, what I do. You ask me. So before my babies leave, I put them on cephalexin antibiotic for seven days before they leave me. That way I make sure there's no streptococcus in that baby before he goes to that one loft race. Plus, the cephalexin kills three different strains of E. coli at the same time. Dr. Steve Weir turned me on to this, okay? And so I, I put them on the cephalexin for seven days. And when they leave, boom, they should be fresh and clean of it. That way, if the circovirus hits them, and the number one killer of babies with circovirus is streptococcus. Number two is E. coli. Number three is canker. Right. So... Most people have a handle on E. coli and canker. Most one life guys have a handle on that. A lot of guys don't don't treat or don't know even about Ceph, you know, about the, the streptococcus because some of the a lot of the guys don't deal with it. Well, but if I'm if I'm sending birds to you and my birds have it, then you the rest of the loss got it within no time. So therefore, 
I try to make sure that my babies are clean of it before they leave. That way, if something hits, that my babies are not in that percentages of birds that die or whatever because of it. And I want them to be clean of that before they leave. So that's one of the main things I do. Uh, I pull the four center tail feathers and I put them on cephalexin for seven days before they leave me. What about vaccines? <clears throat> no vaccines for me. Yeah. I do not vaccinate a baby. And I know all the one life guys preach, oh, vaccinate your babies before you leave. Well, everybody knows me and knows I don't do it. It's not because I'm lazy and because I don't want to do it because that's not the point of it. But them babies don't need three or four vaccinations. They get to a one life race, they get vaccinated. And a lot of them races will give them a booster shot. Well, if I've vaccinated them in the nest, and then I vaccinate them before I ship them. And then you vaccinate them. And then they give them a booster. Wait a minute. That's, the that babies right. don't need, I'm sorry, they don't need it. And I know guys that preach it because they're selling vaccines. And I ain't being ugly, but sorry, but I don't believe in it. I don't vaccinate my babies. Not a pigeon on my place. So baby gets vaccinated. Yeah, and that's. You can ask them. They don't, they don't lose my pigeons to death. And that's the fun part of this is that everybody has their own way of going about it. There's never been in pigeon racing one way to do it. And so nope. everybody has to decide for themselves what they do. And that's just how you go about it. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And your results speak for themselves and what you've been able to do in the one law. So um, what uh, one law successes have you had that you can tell people about? What are the big ones? Oh, wow. Um. One of my favorite ones of all time is when Miss Kimberly got married um, eight years ago. Uh, we got married on Friday, and we won the Triple Crown race on Sunday, won 82,000. Two days later after we got married, I had one on the drop, and she had one on the drop. There were six birds on the drop, and we went 82,000. So that was one of the most memorable yeah. uh, one of my, of, my, of, my life, of my life and probably always will be. Um, and that was before the Triple, you know, before Ron Steinbrenner passed away and that, that race is no longer, but it right. was one of the cool, great races of all time. You know, it was a tough, grueling race, um, 600 miles in one week, three, you know, three different races all in the same week. Just really cool. A one on, you know, and then two and then the three all in the same week. So really neat race and really a neat race to win and, 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 and whatever. Um, I've won the California classic, uh, several times, um, uh, we, I won the Hoosier in 2016 or 17. I can't remember. Um, we won the Royal cup, uh, won the Cuevas classic several times. Uh, we had first ace pigeon at the black gold last year, um, or year before last, um, sheesh, um, you name it. I mean, we've San Diego classic. We just win the other day. Um, we've been blessed. We've won, a, you right. know, we've won about every major, major event there is out there to win. We've, we've, we've been on the first drop, I should say. I mean, winning, uh, but what would I call winning has been on the first drop, but, uh, we've been blessed. We've had a lot of, we won the Texas dash for cash. Um, wow. Just a lot of them. A lot, yeah. It's incredible. And I don't, I don't, I don't keep up with, I mean, a lot of guys are all crazy into that stuff and everything. Half of them, I forgot half of the ones I've win. I just, I don't live for yesterday. I live for tomorrow. Well, so. and I, I, the reason I, I, I wanted to bring that up too is because if someone looks at how you prepare your young birds for one loss and they want to know your, what you've done, then there you go. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. Um, what are the background of your pigeons? Urban Cowboys one that's you know, a famous pigeon of yours. What, what, how did you get started with some of the genetics? Uh, okay. So we'll have to go back to like um, 1995 when I was still in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Challenge, Phil Cowridge's race. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Lester Johnson and Tom Hill, they had a bird on the first drop on that final race. Well, and, and actually he was on the first drop in all three races and he won. 14,000 something dollars. Okay. Well, I had a bird on the first drop on the first race, second drop on the second race and the first drop on the third race with them. Mine was a little hen. Theirs was a cock bird. Well, I was just a young kid then in my mid to early twenties. And so I 
talk to them guys and tried to work out a deal and buy that cockbird from them, you know, and, oh, no, they, no, he's not for sale. No, he's not for sale. Well, uh, a few uh, beers in, <laughs> boys got to getting loose and having a little fun. And so uh, Tom Hill and Lester Johnson, they I was hanging around there with them. That's back in the day when Ryan Jones and the Ray Jones and all them guys, um, uh <laughs> bunch of the guys were all there and them guys were all hanging around and they called me over. He said, Paul, come here. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We will loan this cockbird to you and you can put it on your hen, raise you several rounds. And at the end of the season, get him back to us, man, I couldn't be tickled. I mean, I was just beyond myself. So, okay. I yeah. took the bird. Uh, I, I had him for a year and, and just at that time I was leaving Colorado, moving to Claremore, moving to o Oklahoma. So when I got to Claremore, I started flying and I raised some young birds out of him that year. And I flew young birds in Claremore that year. And I won two races with babies out of this cockbird. So at the end of the season, I did what I was told and I sent the, I called to send the bird back. Well, I couldn't find Lester Johnson nowhere. He'd raised the pigeon. Mm. So I did some search, finally found him. He had moved into Mexico. So I finally tracked him down, got a phone number, tracked him down, and I called him. I said, Mr. Johnson, I got this bird I need to send back to you. He said, Paul, I don't even have pigeons no more. We moved and we're in New Mexico and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I'd give my eye teeth to, to own this pigeon. Could I buy this bird from you? And he said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, you send me $100 and I'll send you a pedigree. And I said, man, I can't get $100 in the air fast enough to yeah, So awesome. I sent him $100. <clears throat> He sends me a pedigree on the pigeon. Well, the the um, the pigeon I named the pigeon the Arizona cock, okay, um, and he was the the old stickle box from um, Waldo Sly down here in Louisiana. And if you look at his pedigree, his imports you know import stickle box on one side right. and, and a little bit of the Fabre on the other side. Uh, and so that's where I started that side of the family well if you back up even a little bit further back in when bob schneider gave me them first pigeons when i left california he gave me them four pairs well them were little stickle bock and and stuff like that too he gave me a little hen 1082 which turned out to be the foundation hen well them, them that birds are still floating to this day charlie mayfield all these people got all them pigeons that all come down to that hen well i got back here in oklahoma and ended up mating the arizona cock to 1082 started creating a whole little little kilometer right there and then birds bred me oh my god the you name it i mean matter of fact urban cowboy is a great great grandson of the arizona cock urban cowboy is the son of miss lucille miss lucille's both of her parents her dad and her mama were both children of the arizona cock so half brother, half sister mating to create yeah. Miss Lucille to create Urban Cowboy. So an Urban Cowboy was the last egg that she laid, and she was 15 years old when she laid it. Wow. So that was the last egg out of her. And uh, and as of to date, he's raised almost six hundred thousand dollars worth of winners between his him, himself, his children, and grandchildren, and great grandchildren, almost six hundred thousand dollars worth of for one loft wins. That's incredible. And did you stock him since he was the last one out of that hen? No. I'm, I'll tell you a little quick little story. I, I made a mistake. And I was going through babies, you know, and so just selecting them and just picking the best ones, you know, and, and I picked the best ones and sent them to the Hoosier. And I got to looking for that baby later on and I thought, where in the heck did I do with that baby? Can't find him nowhere. So then I was looking one day on the Hoosier list at my birds there just seeing what they're out of, you know, because they were starting to train and everything was starting to do good. And I was looking at it and I thought, oh my God, there he is. I sent that baby to the Hoosier. So I called Jim Ward and I said, Jim, I got a little problem. He said, what is it? And I told him the story and he's like, man, he said, next I do a hand inventory, I'll get him for you. I said, okay, please. So he called, I called him the next day and I said, you know what? Cancel that order. I'm not doing it. Fate is fate. It is what it is. Let's race pigeons. So I left him there. The Hoosier goes off. I had one on the first drop and one on the second drop. He was on the second drop. He was the 88th bird through the trap. 
just a few holes out of the money. And I win the race. I was on the first drop, went 18,000 on that deal. So I brought him home, carried him to that winning hen, and the rest is history. Here we are. Yeah. You know, he's we're six hundred thousand dollars almost in wins down from him right now. Yeah, so that's incredible. He's pretty special. And then our other superstar is Kid Kittle. You know, I mean that the, the Bolt fan, the Bolt family. Uh, they're absolutely an amazing set of pigeons uh, worldwide. Yeah. Um, and they have just absolutely turned on the whole world upside down. You know, yeah. with the quality and the speed of these pigeons. Um. And he, uh, as of right now, the last time we figured, I haven't figured in the last little bit, but the last time we figured, I think he was about 384,000 in wins from his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of him for me and my customers uh, with, with you know, down from him. So incredible. Uh, he's unbelievable. Unbelievable. What, uh, let's get into one loft pigeon versus a club pigeon then. You, you take a pigeon yeah. like, can't it, like, urban cowboy that raced at a one loft and, and you cross him out to, you know, kittle lines and, and other lines. What, what are you looking for in a one loft pigeon? And what do you think the difference is between that and a club pigeon? Uh, I, I tell people this all the time. I said, one loft pigeons can win club races, but club pigeons don't win lawn loft races. And I believe that because the cool thing about a one loft pigeon is that bird has to do everything on its own. It's got to have a great immune system. They've got to naturally want to come home to a perch. You know, they got to come home to a crowded loft. They got to come home to, um, you know, just feed and water. They, they, there's no motivation to it. You know, they, they have to do everything naturally. Right. Where club pigeons, you know, we, we add supplements to their water or we do this and we add little peanuts here or we add this or we motivate them. We separate them. You know what I'm saying? We put them together for an hour on Friday. You know, there's just a lot of things to club pigeons. So I think if a guy wants to help his one loft future out and he still club races, I think he should do everything naturally just like a one loft race does and have your birds fly naturally don't motivate, don't made up, don't do nothing, don't, don't do nothing. Don't put them on lights, don't do nothing, but maybe pull the ninth and 10th flight just like a one-loft race does. Treat them just like a one-loft race would treat them and judge your pigeon strictly on birds coming to your house. Don't worry about what you do in the club. Don't worry about what you do in the combine. Judge your family of birds to what's coming to your loft as it being a one loft bird, one loft race coming to your house. So if you send 20 babies to the race this weekend, them 20 birds, judge them 20 pigeons on what's coming to your loft. And that then you start seeing the quality reach to the top. I talked to a friend of mine yesterday, and he's a big time club flyer. He's a good friend of mine. I mean, I'll tell Mike Westfall, okay? I talked to him yesterday. He does like I do. We, we, we keep some birds, we train them out, we're looking for we're looking for for breeders. We're looking for badass pigeons, but we treat them like a one loft race treats them. And so he took them birds yesterday on a forty six mile training toss, first toss they ever been on. And he has five babies out of one pair, all his top pigeons that come in. Well, stats don't lie. Right, numbers don't lie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that there you go. Bam. I just found me a fraternity pair. You know, they were a trial pair of pigeons. I just found me a fraternity pair. So that's what, same with me, same with anybody. I tell people all the time, look, raise an extra round of babies, put them on your race team, train them out, and don't be, uh, don't be a sissy about it. Tra you know, make them earn their keep because, if you baby them, you're not gonna get. You're not gonna see the quality come to the top. You want the quality. That's all you want is the quality. We don't want quantity. We want quality. Right. So, bust their butts hard. Do things to them. And I will say this: I'm fixed to fly club races starting this weekend. We got canceled on Saturday because the weather's really bad. So we're gonna fly on Sunday for the first race this weekend. So all the one loft pigeons that nobody wanted home that nobody wanted, they left here with me. So I fly them in club races. 
And it's absolutely a blast because these pigeons are dynamite. They're out of guys' best pairs. And just because they didn't hit on that day, they don't want them. They don't take them home. They leave them here. And what's crazy is, is last year I did the same identical thing. And I had two cockbirds from one gentleman that both won two races. A one hen from another gentleman that won five races. Um, then I had another another bird from another gentleman that won another race and another and won two races. So it's like these pigeons are unbelievable for club racing. Just because guys left them in there don't mean they're bad, you know, and they're they're quality, quality pigeons. And that's why I say badass one loft pigeons will win in your club races and win big. They're good. They're that's why they're you're using them as one loft birds because the quality is there. And they're winning one life races against the biggest names in the business. So, but treat them like treat them like a one life race at your house, and then you can you're going to find more one life birds. You're going to find more pairs that you can use in one if you're going to fly them in club races. Um, but I think over a period of many years of like myself and a lot of guys I know that don't club race young birds. And I've only been club racing old birds. This will be my second year and only did it because I didn't have anything else to do with the birds that they left. So I'd get rid of them and I didn't want to do that. So other than that, for a guy like myself that don't club race, that only one-off races, you you tend to build a bird over many, many years of continuously bringing home them one-off winners and breeding from them winners and breeding them to a winner and then sending them out, bringing the winners home and breeding them to another winner. Before you know it, you're creating a family of pigeons that that perform and excel at what you're doing as far as birds that need great immune systems, come home, you know, unmotivated, come to a perch, have you know, have to be able to survive being crowded or being in a one loft race, uh, and just all coming to the same place and then birds get out front because they're better. You know, I mean Yeah, uh, and I even, think did they they have to mature quickly you know like you said some of those birds that ended up winning races for you in the club they may not have matured quite quickly enough to be a one loft bird but as yearlings maybe even two-year-olds they could be some of the best pigeons you ever had you never you <clears throat> so in one loft you're looking for those birds that can mature quickly and i think to add to your point earlier uh if there's a particular race someone is looking at flying look at how they train what distances they train Look at the conditions that the day is, if it's a windy one direction or the other, and then try to simulate that with your birds that you are going to train yourselves. Train them just like they do at the race that you're eyeing. So for me, for example, I started, I took a few years off uh, of racing in general. And then in 21, I raised uh, some young birds and was kind of starting to get the, the idea of flying again. I took all of my young birds west and I started slowly getting them down the road and I wanted them to come home from out of the west because as you know being uh, here for so long in Tulsa you're either south or you're north on the wind. West yeah. is going to give you a crosswind one way or the other you're not going to blow homes. So my uh, experimenting with that when I took them all out west uh, I took them like 115, 120 miles. It was a, a real beautiful day but it was a bit tough, real slow. And the cock that came home by himself before all the rest of them came home, uh, I ended up stocking, and he's now produced several one loft winners for me. And I think that's just the same type of blueprint that you're talking about as far as training them out like a one loft. Don't give them, you know, the motivation all that. Let them fly home to a perch. Train them out as the loft or the as the one lofts you want to enter. So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons, um, you know, I. Uh, I was able to be successful at your race. You have that race course out of the West as well. And, uh, you know, my, I've, I've, I've done some training like that kind of prepping for this sort of thing. So, um, I think, you know, getting that simulation for your birds training them that way will help you select, you know, this is for guys that maybe you're trying to sort out what birds are going to be good for one loft. That's a big way to do it. Yes. And I've, you know, I, I'll say this, some of my best breeders, uh, come off of the California race course, like the California Classic, the Royal Cup, the Holiday Cup. Some of my top, top breeders uh, all come off that course. It's a really good course, a working course. It can Sometimes it can be fast, but it's still working, and the birds still have to be smart and have a lot of brains and navigate because 
50 or 60 miles of desert, hit a five, 6,000 foot mountains, go over the, down back into the 60, 70, 80 miles of more desert, and then back up through the mountains for another 100, 125 miles. And they've got to navigate through all them, through all them channels. And if they hit the wrong one, they're out over the Gulf. If they hit the wrong one, they're out over Mexico and they ain't coming back. So they have to have brains. They have to have endurance. And so therefore that's what you want. And you know what I'm saying? Um, just like birds down at the dash for cash last year, you know what I'm saying? Them birds that are steadily, you know, 12, 1300 yard a minute pigeons, them pigeons will breed you one loft winners. Promise you. That's what you want. I want a loft full of them pigeons that come hard and consistently keep coming. Don't, don't quit and do it week after week after week. And so his, his race last year was, was awesome because of the uh, consistently same race, you know, four times in a row, uh, you know, you get to see quality, then birds just keep coming to the cop and keep staying at the top. Um, and that's what you want to see. I mean, I, nobody, I ain't being ugly, but nobody wants a blow home. I don't, I hate them. I mean, they're just, I hate them. Right. But um, people don't realize, and I'll, and I'll say this, a blow home is a blow home. But at the same time, you go 400 miles with a blow home, that pigeon still got a pump. Right. You still got a pump for 400 miles, no matter blow home or no blow home. And I get up in that jet with, with Dan Corey, you know what I'm saying? And we got a big old heavy tailwind. We went to the Hoosier last year, and we had a 120-mile-an-hour tailwind. Well, you know what he had to continue to do the whole time we were going? Continue to raise that nose up. Yeah. Because it was blowing us. He right. had to continue to raise that nose up. Right. Same with the pigeons. With a little bit of a headwind or a crosswind and stuff, they got a little bit of lift. They can kind of float. They got a little bit of a lift. With a tailwind, they got no lift. It's shoving them the whole time. It's shoving them. So, therefore, they have to kind of keep the front end lifted up. And it's it's a work. But yeah. um, I don't I don't like them. But they still have to pump no matter what, you know what I'm saying, if it's fast or slow. So uh, it is what it is. I don't like them kind of races. Uh, it happens. Uh, I've been slowly but surely adding some of them, you know, the kittle pigeons over the last, you know, since 2017, 18. I've had the, pig the kittle pigeons here, and I've added to them, and they, I've put, blended them into the family to add some more speed to my, you know, to my family. Um but at the end of the day, I still want one to go 1,200. I'd rather have one that'll go 1,200 than one that'll go out in 1,900. Right. So, um, but it is what it is. But I always tell people cutting up, you know, all the time, look, distant pigeons can fly fast, but fast pigeons can't fly the distance. So, you know, you've, you've got to have a happy medium. You know, right. you get these, these speed pigeons, they're big, powerful, you know, and take them birds 400 miles. They just, they can't handle it. They're just too big. They're too heavy. They're too muscled up. Yeah. You know, you take a, you take a, a big old linebacker or a big old, you know, big old lineman. He can't run with a ride receiver. I no. Mean, he, physically, he's just not designed to do it. They but can, yeah, can he they can block be, for the quarterback to, you know, he can block for the yeah. quarterback to throw to that wide receiver. But so there's different, there's different jobs or different pigeons for different, different courses. Now that's a great and, example. You, you know. gotta you gotta blend, you know, you gotta make that pigeon. Here's something, here's one of my biggest keys. I think this is the anybody that knows me knows I'm a fanatic. I do not like big pigeons. I don't like them, I don't try to have them, I don't want them, I don't breed for them. Everything I do in my program, I breed to shrink my pigeon. I I breed him down. Everything I do, if I make I got a medium cock, I'm putting him on a small hen. If I got a big powerful hen, I'm putting her on a small cock. I don't I don't make medium to medium. I don't make big to big. I, I'm constantly trying to shrink that pigeon down because um, the smaller, they're, they're, they're more maneuverable, they're athletic, they're, they can go further, they're just not as heavy, they're not carrying as much muscle, um, they don't eat as much. I mean, just everything in general. So yeah. uh, look at your, you know, look at your, your badass hawks, you know, your falcons and stuff. They, they're, they're not much to them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they can do it all day. Yeah. So, those most dangerous hawks are those little ones that come in and hit them, hit them as they land. Yeah. Little troopers are bad. Yeah. They're bad. And if, you, and if you ever grab one of them things, there's nothing to them. I mean, they're yeah. just, they're tiny. Yeah. They got a lot of feathers, but they don't, there's nothing to them. So I want to get your opinion on an idea that, 
I know others have probably talked about this, but I, I want to kind of put this out there and see what your thoughts are. Okay. If, if club racing is continuing to dwindle down now here in Tulsa, I still have enough people in the combine and federation to, to compete. If you, if, if, if club racing continues to shrink down in certain areas, it'll stay for a while. But I think one of the things one loss could potentially do is make their series more like a club series and as many races as they have available, plus uh, potentially multiple seasons of a one loft, meaning your bird can fly at a one loft for eight races, like a club, eight races as a young bird. And then as a yearling fly, 10 different races. And I know the logistics behind that are tough and having to continue to get people to pay their perch fees and everything would be a challenge. But do you think that there's some sort of solution to that or, or something we can do in the U S that would give us a, a race series that would be somewhat like a club experience where the birds are going through more than just two, or, you know, a lot of one loss are three to four races. Some of them like the Quavis has around seven races when you continue the sprint, when you can uh, include the sprint that he has in his categories. But I think if we could provide some sort of race that would be uh, multiple distances over a couple of different seasons, that would be really interesting. I, I don't know exactly how it would work though. Uh, I don't know personally. Uh, Jeff, I think the problem with that is the cost, you know what I'm saying? Nobody really wants to put out the cost it would take for a guy like myself to do that, you know, as far as a big six, eight bird, eight, eight race series and young birds and six or eight races and old birds. I mean, nobody wants to put out the cost that it would take for somebody like myself or anybody else one off guy to do it uh for one and then two you know you're gonna not find a lot of guys that want to do it um i don't know me being personally if you want personal opinion honest opinion i don't i don't send a races that's more than four or five races i don't like a i don't like a six seven eight race series young bird i just don't like it uh there's too many too many variances there for your bird for them to get my money and then something happened to my bird where sure. it get hurt hopped or something and it, it's just as my mom would say the law of after the, the law of average sooner or later will get you yeah that makes and sense to me, the to me i think that's one of the biggest problems you got with a big long series like that um you know, I've had that happen. You know, I had a dynamite bird at a, at a race last year, and it's a, it's a long seven-race series race. Right. You know, and the, the, the sixth race, boom, you know, um, something happens. The bird's just killing it. I mean, he's just sitting, sitting at the top in average speed. He's just – so he didn't get lost. Something happened to him. He got hawked or run into a wire or something. And I know that's a lot. It's, it's just part of it. But at the same time, I got nothing. You know what I'm saying? I got nothing for it. I got nothing out of it. I got nothing. I'd rather have a three or a four race series and I at least got to see the final and I at least either got beat or I beat you, one of the two, you know? So it's, that's just my opinion. I don't know that that will ever be a thing or ever be uh, possible to be a thing because I don't know nobody that would do it. And for one, I don't know nobody that would want to pay what, what it would take to be able to do that. Yeah, it would, it would cost a lot of perch, a lot of perch, and there'd be a lot of cost involved. And obviously, the guys whose birds are at the bottom consistently aren't going to want to keep paying for it. And the guys that are at the top are going to want their birds back to breed from. So it's it's very complex and challenging. But I was just kind of thinking about that the other day of how how can you get, uh, you know, something similar to that. But um, yeah, um. I don't know. I, I just, oh. it, yeah, it, it's just something I was thinking, but I, I, I think you made great points on to some of the issues with it. It's something that, you know, I need to keep expanding on the idea and thinking more about how something like that would work, but yeah. Um, um, yeah. I think it would have something to be really, it had to be looked at hard. I just don't know. Like you said, I don't know if you could find nobody to, to jump on board with it. Yeah. Unless somebody strictly set up a race strictly, for that and they had plans to do that you know flying with young birds i think there is a race like that jeff if i'm not mistaken there's a guy i don't know the name of the race um it's kind of the same i think it's i think he does it like that you know he fly a whole series like seven or eight nine races in young birds 
and then you can pay him to hold them over, and he'll he'll do a, 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 an old bird series with them too. I can't yeah. remember the name of that race, uh, but I think that there is one like that. But you know, there's not a lot of participation, and there's not a lot of money backing it. You know, there's not a lot of money yeah. in it. So. Yeah. Well, um, what's your advice to new flyers or maybe guys that are getting back into the sport? What strategy, if you had to start over, would you take on, uh, whether it's club or one loft? What What do you uh, recommend people do? Number one for me, it's quality. Don't don't get quantity. Don't don't. Um, there's nothing wrong with people giving you pigeons. And a lot of times, some of the best pigeons I've ever got in my life are given to me. They're better than pigeons I bought. But they come from people that were personal friends or, you know, something that somebody that I could trust. But at the same time, if you want my honest opinion, if you're going to play the one loft game, find somebody that's winning at what you want to do. And that's where you need to be knocking on their door. You know, don't, don't go to a to a club guy and say, hey, I want to buy, you know, the best pigeons you got to go compete with one loft guys. It won't work. Uh, and don't go to a guy that, that kicks ass at old birds and say, hey, I want to buy, you know, your best two pair of old birds and, and then expect to compete against the good guys in the one loft race because it ain't going to work. Go to the guys that's winning the one loft races and get a pair or two from them, even if it costs you. People think, oh, I need six or eight or ten. No, you don't need. You need two or three good pair, really good pair. Because two or three really good pair and three or four pair of pumpers, you're way better off than ten pair of average pigeons. Go find a guy that's winning at the top one-off races and, and buy a pair from him or buy two pairs from him. Uh, or, you know, here's something that I tell people all the time. Look. There's a lot of good pigeons out there and a lot of good guys that have good pigeons. And people think, well, I, I'll, I'll go to this guy and I'll buy a bird from him and I'll go to, to me and buy a bird from me and then I'll pair them together and think I'll win the one-off races. That don't work. If you're going to go to a man, get what's working for him. Get you right. a pair or two from him. Put them together. Don't go doing this and now down the road – if you got a pair from me and a pair from you and they're they're winning for you and you want to pair them together, sure. But I don't recommend that you go get a bird from me and a bird from you and pair them together and go spend a thousand dollars a bird at the Hoosier and, and expect to be at the top. Um get get a pair from you, get a pair from me, get a pair from whoever, and put them together like they say. They're, I always told guys that all the time when I was young. And I got my first rollers from the, the family I started with. I went to the man and I said, look, I want to buy a kit of rollers from you. And he said, all right, here's two kits. Pick what you want. And I said, nope, I'm not picking what I want. I want you to pick them for me. I ain't picking them. You pick them. You know your pigeons. I don't know your pigeons. I want you to pick my pigeons for me as to where you, if you were picking them to put in your stock loft. So yeah. his knowledge, and if he's a good guy, he's going to want to help you, then he's going to pick right. the best he's got in there to help you. And that's the way I do with people all the time. And the smart people that buy a bird from me every now and then or whatever, they'll say, hey, I want this bird. Or, or then some guys are smart and they'll say, look, I want, I want to buy a pair from you. I'll say, okay, what do you want? And I have very few that are smart enough to say, you pick them for me. Because do you know what that does? If I'm any kind of good person, then, then it puts the pressure on me to go in there. I'm going to pick the best, absolutely the best I got because I, I, you asked me to pick them, and then I'm, I want to pick you the best I got so you can be successful. Yeah, makes sense. Me, that makes you know that makes me feel good when I get the phone call saying, "Hey, man, I just won this race, or I was just on the drop, or I was just this." Well, there you go. That's what that's what I'm after. I love to get them phone calls. Yeah. So. If I can recommend anything, if you're going to get in the one loft game, find a guy that's winning where you want to win and go knock on his door and say, look, this is, I want this. It may cost you a little bit, but in the long run, it's cheaper. Yeah. I promise you it's cheaper. Exactly. So well, is, there any, is there anything that we haven't covered or you want to add that we haven't talked about or that I missed? Uh, 
man, I don't know, just I think the sport in one loss is growing. Uh man, if you I mean if you think about it, look around, there's a one loss popping up on every corner. Yeah. There are plenty, plenty of options out there for you. Um I mean, they've got every from cheap ones to expensive ones, they're out there. There is a there you there is a variety pack. You got somewhere to go no matter what you want to do, if you can't afford much or if you can afford a bunch. So um do your research, you know what I'm saying? And 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 uh you know, pick the races that that you have the birds for because it, there is a, such a thing a horse for the course. So if you got birds that work good in Texas, find Texas races. If you got birds that work good in California, find races in California. Um, or if I've had people call and say, "Look, you know, you do good in California. What are you winning with? I want I want some of them, or I want to know how to how how to do what I'm doing." So that's the key. Find what wins where you're wanting to play. Yeah. And that's go after that. Well, I think that's so, great advice. And where, where can people find you? Website, uh, Facebook, what, yeah, what you... uh, on our website, flying D franchise fraternity. You can find me on my, everything's on there. Phone numbers on there. Um, we help out as much as we can. We, we try to help, you know, people all the time, beginners and stuff, um, as much as we can, as far as the birds available that we have available. Um, you know, I love helping people. I love helping new people get into business. And I will say this. Let me say this. I will. I, I want to say this. Sure. If you're going to help somebody or somebody's going to buy something from you, you're, it's your obligation to give them the best they can either afford or the best you got. Because I tell people all the time, guys like, ah, oh, man, I got this. It's It's been okay. I think I'll just sell this pigeon. Man, you're not helping the guy that's buying it. Right. Eliminate that pigeon out of the, the gene pool because you sell it to a guy or even if you give it to a new flyer and it did not work for you and you give it to a new flyer, he spends two years realizing it don't work for him. So now you've put him two years back and he hasn't won nothing in two years. So therefore, if he's not a strong person, as far as strong wanting to stay in the sport, you're going to lose him. Yeah, it makes because sense. Because he's gonna realize, man, I, I, I can't, I can't get a sniff. Right. So try to give somebody. If you're gonna help somebody or donate some something to somebody or you know give somebody or sell somebody something, try to sell them as best you can sell them, or try to give them the best you can give them your best. Because a man that's winning or a man that's competing at the somewhat top of the game, he's hooked. He yeah. ain't going nowhere. Right. But a man that's at the bottom of the sheet that never sees his name nowhere but at the bottom, pretty soon, hey, I'll go raise billy goats. You know, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll find me some fantails that I, you know, I, I, whatever. So so if I can give any advice, give give the best you can give if you're going to give somebody something. Or if they're going to buy something from you, try to pick the best you got to give them. Help yeah. them out. Because when you help them, you're helping the sport for long term because – if they're doing good and winning, they're not going nowhere. I think so. that's great advice, and that's one of the reasons I'm enjoying doing these conversations with different people all over the world about pigeons is to try to raise awareness, get some different viewpoints, because that's the beauty of this, right? There's so many different ways to to do this game, yeah. and yeah. people need to figure out what works for them in their area, wherever the part of the world they're in, and and uh, I think they can take little things here and there from people uh, advice wise and, and continue to grow the sport. And, and so I'm really appreciative that you came on and uh, appreciate Kimberly for helping us get set up here today so we could do this. And, and I uh, can't thank you enough. I could talk to you all day about pigeons. So I've taken up enough of your time though. Oh, you're good, brother. I appreciate it all as well. I appreciate you having me, man. We enjoyed it. Um, help, you know, like I said, help somebody and do it right. And this, let's have some fun. If yeah. you want to, if you want to fly in the uh in the, with the big boys and for big money so give us a holler we'd love to have you sounds great all right um i'm gonna have to have you on again for an update here at some point and we'll keep talking because yeah. like i said i can talk to you all day man so i appreciate it and all right, buddy. Uh, we'll we'll talk to you again soon thank you paul thanks jeff all right take care see you later